Prestige heads and welcome to your weekly American Prestige. I'm Danny Bessner here as always with Derek Davison. Uh, and we'd like to start the show today with a reading, a, a very important tweet that was just <laughs> tweeted by friend of the pod, president of Brazil, Jair Bolsonaro, who's finally, after we've been DMing him and emailing him, sending carrier pigeons, asking him to uh, weigh in on cancel culture. So this is what Jair had to say. Yeah, finally, he's getting the message. This is finally this is good. Finally, here here it goes. Quote, I'm not sure what at Joe Rogan thinks about me or about my government, but it doesn't matter. If freedom of speech means anything, it means that people should be free to say what they think, no matter if they agree or disagree with us. Stand your ground. Hugs from Brazil. Thumbs up. Jair Bolsonaro. So I just thought that was a meaningful thing. You know, we've all been talking about cancel culture, but sometimes someone just posts something and it's they, they just end the argument. It's so just I just getting, wanted our yeah, listeners. Just, that's a mic drop moment. Right yeah, there. just that that was his, you know, top moment <sighs> maybe in his political career. So thanks, Jair. We really appreciate it from your friends up north. But why don't we get into the news, Derek? Because as always, there is a lot going on in the world. Um, So last week we spoke about the coup in uh, Burkina Faso, but now there's there's been a coup in a Guinea Bissau. Uh, attempted coup. Uh, attempted, attempted coup. coup. Apologies. Attempted yeah. coup in, in Guinea Bissau. So what's been happening there, Derek? Yeah. So um, sometime Tuesday, like late morning, early afternoon, the president of Guinea Bissau, uh, Umaro Sissoko Mbalo. Um, sorry, I'm, I know I probably wrecked that, but uh, I did the yeah, best. Someone I should could. do a supercut of us um, fucking up foreign leaders. Fucking names. up names. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's uh, you know, it's uh, I'm 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 trying, man. I'm trying. Anyway, he was in a cabinet meeting uh, inside the government palace in Bissau. A group of soldiers surrounded the building. There was a lot of gunfire, clearly, and you know, an attempt at um, either taking him captive or killing him, uh, along with uh, many other Ghanaian officials. It failed. The attempt failed. Security forces drove off the uh, apparent coup plotters. We were attacked with very heavy weaponry for a duration of five hours. But now, everything is under control. There were at least 11 people killed uh, in this incident, four of them civilians. And uh, Mbalo is, is still president. So uh, unlike Burkina Faso, Guinea, and Mali, uh, the three West African countries that are currently under military rule, uh, Guinea-Bissau is not as of this writing. I, I uh, we're don't... speaking, Tarek. Actually, <laughs> you've been speaking. <laughs> well, sorry, this is speaking. Yeah, sorry. Jeez. Uh, anyway, as of this podcast, Guinea-Bissau is still under civilian rule. I don't know why th- these folks attempted uh, a coup. I don't know the the rationale. And Balo has said uh, he thinks it's linked to, or he suggested that it may be linked to drug trafficking, which is a problem in Guinea-Bissau. It's sort of a way station uh, uh, if you're shipping product from, let's say, Latin America to Europe. Uh, so that's possible. Uh, but of course, nobody who uh, was on the attempted coup side uh, is actually talking right now. So uh, there's nothing to really weigh his scenario against. I, I don't know that. I mean, if, if that's the case, if it was about drug trafficking, then that would uh, distinguish this attempted coup from the, uh, the, the coups that have succeeded uh, in these other countries, which have had to do with things like poor governance, corruption, problems with you know extended islamist militancy so yeah i don't i i don't want to suggest that this attempted coup was part of a wider kind of regional problem because all of these incidents have their own unique causes but but it does speak to a level of military activity and involvement in politics in west africa that looked like you know was sort of dying down for a while there but clearly the the militaries of the region are deciding to to get back into politics so does this suggest anything about regional dynamics i know you said that they they all have unique causes and we can't necessarily say that they're directly connected but does this suggest anything about where the region is in international politics i think this one is less indicative uh, than the others and i i think that partly because the dynamics 
uh, of Guinea-Bissau are different. Guinea-Bissau was a Portuguese colony, and I don't say that to be reductionist or to you know to take this all all back to uh, you know European colonialism. Uh, but the experience of being an ex-Portuguese colony is substantively different, substantively different from the experience of being an ex-French colony, as these other places uh, were. France is very still very active, let's say, uh, in, in the places that uh, uh, it once held as colonies. And so there's a lot of uh, similarities between Burkina Faso and Mali, for example, that don't necessarily apply in this case. But yeah, I mean, I do think you can, uh, again, you could start to, to look at why are all of these regional militaries, you know, uh, in the, why has there been this flurry of uh, coups or coup attempts in the last couple of years to to you know region wide? And I I don't have any good answers for that, um, but it it is an interesting dynamic that is probably worth asking some bigger questions about. Yeah, and we'll definitely get a specialist of West Africa. And, on, and again, uh, I mean, you know, without. Uh, and partly because this this coup failed, and so all we have to go on is the word of uh, Guinean authorities as to what was going on here. Uh, we don't really, I don't think, uh, have a have a good sense of what the causes necessarily were. So it's hard to compare uh, to these coups that succeeded and and whose juntas now are you know uh, have had the chance to articulate uh, what they think were the problems that they were addressing. Yeah, and we'll definitely talk about that more. So why don't we go over to uh, North Korea and their recent test of an intermediate missile? Yes. So this was kind of a big deal. I mean, as people know, and we've mentioned on the, the program uh, for the past few weeks, uh, in Jan- throughout January, North Korea tested uh, weapons seven times, which is a, a pretty big escalation in terms of the frequency uh, of its weapons tests. But on Sunday... Uh, for the first time in, uh, I think, four years, I guess, the North Koreans tested something other than a short-range weapon. So something other than a short-range ballistic missile or artillery or rockets or, you know, uh, something like a more tactical thing. They tested a uh, Hwasong-12, it, uh, it seems, uh, which is an intermediate-range missile, a ballistic missile that's capable of hitting Guam so it can hit U.S. territory or at least territory that the United States uh, claims is its own, which makes it a, a more direct challenge to the United States. And the Biden administration has responded to that by calling for a UN Security Council meeting by, you know, expressing a little more outrage than they've done after these other tests that the North Koreans have conducted. So it's a clear escalation. I will be engaging uh, with our allies, uh, the uh, Koreans, as well as Japanese, who are uh, also uh, threatened by this to look at other options for uh, responding. As to why they're testing that missile at this point, I don't know. There may be some technical reasons. Uh, the North Koreans have been testing a variety of weapons of late, glide vehicles, for example, and um, they may have some components of those weapons that they wanted to test on a Hwasong 12 platform or to see if they could be adapted into that missile system. So that's possible. The other thing is maybe they're really you know, trying to get Washington's attention and you know, either kickstart diplomacy or get some kind of engagement on the issue of uh, humanitarian relief. North Korean economy is, has been very badly hit by COVID. They imposed a very strict uh, lockdown that cut off even trade uh, with China, which is pretty much North Korea's only reliable outlet into the world. Uh, so it, it's pretty clear that, that people have been suffering. So that, that it may have just been sort of a, a you know, way to send up a, a flare and get some attention. So this is a question for a broader conversation, but when maybe we could just delve into it slightly here. When something like this happens, what does this indicate about the Chinese-North Korean relationship? Because on one hand, there are arguments that essentially North Korea is a client state of China, and there's other arguments that North Korea really does operate significantly independently. So when something like this happens, when there's like aggressive might not be the right word, but when there's a provocative test like this, what does this suggest about the North Korean-China relationship? Um, particularly, you know, given what we're, we'll talk about in a second, what, what else has been going on in the world? Yeah, I mean, I think it, I, I think all indications are, um, as, as is usually the case when the, you know, DC establishment talks about, uh, kind of tries to flatten um, 
smaller adversaries out into proxies of, of bigger adversaries. So, you know, we do this with uh, armed groups in the Middle East. We do it with North Korea. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, it's much more complicated. The relationship is much more complicated than that. The North Koreans do their thing. Um, China you know, supports them most of the time, but there have been instances where they've engaged in really provocative tests, things like nuclear tests, uh, intercontinental ballistic missile tests, the kind of missiles that can, you know, hit uh, the mainland United States, uh, where the Chinese government has sort of said, you know, hey, well, you know, hold on a second, this isn't productive, you're, you're you know, this is too provocative. Um, and And so, you know, I think in those cases, we can see that the relationship is not a, a purely proxy relationship. That there are there's a there's a push and pull. The North Koreans do what they think they need to do, and China responds, you know, uh, accordingly. Uh, I, I don't uh, in this case. I don't think r- will rise this particular test uh, because it was an, an intermediate missile missile and not um, intercontinental. Nice I don't CBM, think it will yeah. rise to the level where you'll get like a a, a kind of tis- tisking tisk tisking uh, statement from China, but uh, you know, I, I think it's been pretty well established to my mind uh, that that they're not always operating on the same page. Yeah, th- that is what's really interesting to me because that does suggest that there's more fluidity in the what happens for uh, in the future with regards to North Korea than one might uh, imagine. You know, the relationship isn't quite you know U.S. Saudi or U.S. Israel. The China North Korea relationship is something different, uh, even though we often use analogies to uh, understand it. Yeah, I think so. And and you know, when the United States works within that construct in a savvy way, in other words, when we don't just plot. North Korea in China's lap and say, this is your problem, you deal with it, uh, as though, you know, China were the boss of North Korea. Or, you know, when we, when we you know, work with China in, in sort of trying to corral North Korea, I mean, there's been, there's been some progress that has been made in the past in, in you know, doing things that way. Uh, but the United States typically uh, just kind of says North Korea is... China's baby and and they have to deal with it which you know is not is not a productive way of viewing that that dynamic um, speaking of being productive, uh, why don't we talk a little bit about what's been going on um, in Ukraine? Uh, your weekly, uh, I wish uh, we had like a uh, an audio thing. Jake, could you put in an audio thing? Your weekly update on Ukraine. Put some fun <laughs> audio here for the for the listeners. But uh, Derek, what's been going on, man? So nothing dramatic has been going on, um, but there was an interesting uh, development. Earlier this week, uh, the Spanish newspaper El País uh, managed, it seems, to get its hands on copies of the written replies that the U.S. and NATO uh, gave to Russia's security demands or requests or questions, whatever you want to call them, uh, which they delivered to to Russia last week. And it's it's interesting to look at them. I mean, I don't know. You can't draw any conclusions until the Russian government kind of uh, offers its take, I guess, which they've sort of done in uh, dribs and drabs, but they say they're still reviewing these documents. What's interesting to me about them is a couple of things. One, uh, the NATO response is considerably more antagonistic than the U.S. response. It's just kind of very dismissive, uh, almost insultingly so, uh, of, you know, Russia's security concerns, whereas the U.S. document seems to outline a couple of ways that we could move forward here in a productive way, I think. And, and actually, if the Russians, and they've, they've said, you know, they, they kind of like a couple of things uh, about the U.S. response, if they seize on this and it, it becomes a, a, a sort of springboard to further progress, you could get something that emerges from this crisis that uh, could actually be positive. And, and those pathways... Uh, one of them has to do with the conflict in Ukraine and the, you know, sort of reviving the Normandy format, which is the French and German uh, brokered talks between Ukraine and Russia that are supposed to, uh, you know, work on implementing what's called the Minsk Agreement, which is defined kind of a, a broad outline for what it would take to end that conflict. We've already seen that format get revived. There was a meeting of the four countries, the four principles, last month. There's supposed to be another one this month after a long period of dormancy. Ending that conflict would be a huge success. I mean, it would be a dramatic uh, development. It would definitely take down the temperature 
uh, in eastern Ukraine between Kiev and Moscow uh, quite a bit. And it would do a lot for the people who are living in eastern Ukraine, not just in the Donbass region, the separatist region, but all around that front line. Uh, there was just a, a report, I think, maybe Human Rights Watch, one of the one of these international NGOs this week, uh, about the conditions under which people are living in that region. And it's just horrifying. I mean, it's, you know, every day you got to be worried that some, you know, unit on either side of the front is going to decide to shell uh, the other side. You got to be worried about landmines. You got to be worried about, you know, getting access to basic needs like food. Um, so it, it's it's just been a wretched existence for people. And the, the conflict has been frozen for so long that they're just kind of stuck in this uh, in this limbo. So, you know, that would be great if, if you know, you could re-energize peace talks around that conflict. That would be fantastic. The other way out potentially is a discussion about Weapon systems. The U.S. response alluded to a willingness to re-engage with Russia on basically the contours of the old intermediate-range nuclear forces treaty, which the Trump administration scrapped, but which you know prevented or limited both uh, NATO and uh, on the Russian end uh, from putting intermediate-range missiles in Europe. Uh, really having intermediate range missiles in the field at all to some extent. And, you know, the, the U.S. response suggested an openness to talking about weapon systems. So that would include those kinds of systems. It would probably include uh, missile defense systems like the, the Aegis uh, Ashore system, which takes these uh, missile defense that the U.S. Navy has developed and, and puts it on shore. Uh, the Russians have a lot of concerns about that because they feel it could be easily rejiggered from a defensive missile system to an offensive missile system. So revival of arms control talks could be another way to to sort of uh, progress out of this situation, which would be excellent. Uh, I don't want to leave people on a happy note because really nothing has changed in terms of the dynamic. The Russians are still surrounding Ukraine. Everybody you know, in the West is still talking about uh, uh, an invasion, although the U.S. government has now said it's not going to talk about an imminent invasion anymore because it's not sure that an invasion is, in fact, imminent. Oh, uh, OK. What well, Once again, yeah. we predicted what would happen. <laughs> Uh, so that I mean, I guess that is a little Best bit of a development, business, but in terms of, uh, you know, in terms of the actual situation on the ground, not much has changed. But I, I do see these ways that uh, if if uh, you know th- that could be grabbed onto and and could offer a way out of the situation. Do you know what this reminds me of? It, uh, Derek, tell me tell me if you're familiar with this. But the second Berlin crisis of like 1958 to 1961, when there was a lot of saber rattling around Berlin and uh, Soviet and U.S. leaders went back and forth for literal years, and then nothing changed. Um, this really reminds me of that. This this reminds me of sort of this one of the highly tension filled moments of geopolitical history that, in retrospect, don't don't appear that dangerous, but at the time seem terrible. I think I don't think that's true for things like the Cuban Missile Crisis, but when one looks at the second Berlin crisis. This is really giving me echoes uh, of that, what's going on with Ukraine today. I've said that I think the, the likeliest outcome here is nothing uh, changes at all. Russia, uh, you know, the, 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 the conflict in the Donbass is a tool that the Russians can use to keep Ukraine uh, destabilized. Uh, they don't have necessarily an interest in seeing that conflict end completely. Um, and the West, you know, certainly is... is uh, always interested in hyping up potential conflict with Russia. So, yeah, I don't, I, I think you're probably right. I think the likeliest outcome here is a lot of saber rattling, but nothing really happens. Uh, and yet, the lingering shreds of optimism that I have inside me uh, lead me to say, you know, it would be great if, if uh, what came out of this was actually an end to the, the Donbass conflict or, and or uh, you know, some re-engagement on arms control. That would be, those would be fantastic developments if they, they actually happen. So why don't we go over to Syria? And uh, the U.S. just um, had an operation that killed an ISIS leader. So uh, explain explain that to us, Derek. Uh, why should yes. we care? <laughs> so, well, that's a different question uh, altogether. But uh, yeah, the U.S. apparently um, undertook a raid uh, overnight in northwestern Syria uh, that wound up, ended with the death under some set of circumstances, uh, of Abu Ibrahim al-Hashimi al-Qurayshi, the leader of the Islamic State, the man who succeeded Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi when, when uh, in a similar raid uh, in 2019, U.S. forces went into northwestern Syria, had found him. Uh, he wound up 
killing himself, uh, allegedly at least, uh, detonating a suicide vest. That's the story I think they're going with about Qureshi as well, uh, that he was sort of cornered and you know had access to a, a suicide vest and detonated it so as not to be uh, taken captive. So that's, I mean, that's all I, I really know at this point. Uh, there were about a dozen, maybe 13, I think, civilians killed in this raid. Uh, again, the U.S. is sort of attributing that to this suicide act that Qureshi uh, made, that, you know, saying that these people were caught in the explosion. Uh, who who really knows, frankly, based on what we've learned just in the last couple of months, you know, with the New York Times uh, and other outlets reporting on civilian casualties in the war on terror and the way that the U.S investigates these things. Uh, we'll probably never know if they were actually killed in the, the bombing or if they were you killed by U.S. forces. But Derek, uh, President Barack Obama said every killing that we do is legal. What, what about that? <laughs> well, I'm sure, yeah, they'll be designated as, uh, you know, even if the U.S. killed them, they'd be designated as collateral damage. Enemy combatants, the, the, yeah. Right, enemy, yeah damage, well, enemy yeah. combatants are collateral damage. The the value of killing the, the head of Islamic State, even though, you know, he was in a hidey hole in northwestern Syria and who knows how much of an actual operational role he had, uh, they'll say it was worth the the risk to civilians and, and they're, therefore, you know, fully legal and permissible. Yeah, great. Uh, the rule of law, baby. Uh, Derek, yeah. I'd like to pull a bit of an audible if this is okay. Um, yeah. Could we talk a little bit about Afghanistan and that recent, like the the starvation that's been going on there, and and the um, the migration movements? If if you're able to talk about that, uh, sure. So uh, maybe you could just quickly explain what's going on um, before we move to what we scheduled to be our final topic. But I'd, I'd love to, uh, for our listeners to get an update about what's been going on in, in Afghanistan, especially because we're, we're going to start this long series on the history of Afghanistan that kind of ends with the withdrawals. So just to give people a sense of what's going on. Yeah, I mean, there have been a couple of developments this week, but in general, I mean, I, I you know, we've we've talked about the humanitarian situation in Afghanistan in the past. It hasn't improved; probably gotten worse as winter has, uh, you know, really set in. We're sort of in the dead of that season. I mean, you know, Afghanistan is still uh, unable to access most humanitarian assistance. Their foreign assets are still frozen under U.S. sanction. Aid groups are still reluctant to work in Afghanistan, both for practical reasons, because they're, you know, they're concerned about the, the climate there, the environment there uh, under the Taliban, and for fear of U.S. sanctions, basically, or fear of international sanctions. Uh, there was a, um, a meeting, I want to say last week, um, in Europe between uh, a group of European diplomats and a group of Taliban representatives to try and work out uh, some way of getting humanitarian aid into the country. But uh, they didn't, to, uh, as far as I could tell, they didn't make a lot of progress. I mean, they issued a statement where they sort of talked in vagaries about, uh, you know, agreeing to work on this problem and, and that sort of thing. But as far as I could tell, uh, there was no specific um, outcome from those meetings. Yeah, so there, I mean, there's an AP report that people, you know, if you if you want to know what's going on that just came out, I think, uh, this week, earlier this week, about the sort of dire straits that, that the Afghan people are in um, as winter has set in and they're, they're lacking access to fuel, lacking access to medicine, food, all the, the sort of basics of, uh, of life. So uh, the situation is not great. The crisis has actually driven prices of organs down. Prices have gone down from 2,000 US dollars for kidneys to 1,500 US dollars. Others are contemplating even selling their children to survive. On the, I guess, plus side, also this week, the Qatari government reached an agreement with the Taliban to allow evacuation flights to resume. Those flights had been suspended in December uh, under some Taliban demands that they their own personnel, their own people be allowed to uh, to travel on those flights to go abroad and, and do fundraising. The Qataris had refused that. Uh, they've apparently come to an agreement to allow two chartered evacuation flights out of Kabul per week, uh, which will give people who have travel papers or who are citizens of other countries uh, the ability to get out of the country. Probably the Taliban has said they would honor those things. So for those people, there there may be a new way out. Uh, for people who don't have travel documents or aren't citizens of other countries, they're still certainly facing a, a pretty rough time here. 
Yeah, and we'll continue to um, update update on that. And so, why don't we turn to our final topic, which is this uh, Wall Street Journal report about um, Iran's potential nuclear breakout capability, and in particular the neoconservative um, reaction to it. Yeah, so there's a story in the Washington Post uh, today, Thursday, February third, from oh, Washington Post. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't know why. No, it? not Washington Post. No, you were right. It's the Wall Street Journal. I don't know why. Oh I said my Washington god! Post. Sorry, never ever uh, disagree with me in public again. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. <laughs> I should never do it. Uh, by Lawrence Norman, who's the Wall Street Journal's uh, Iran deal reporter and also one of the favorites of the uh, the people who don't want there to be an Iran nuclear deal. Uh, he's uh, his report here uh, is based on you know anonymous comments from U.S. officials, but the idea being that. Um, Iran's breakout time, which is this really lousy measure, frankly, <laughs> one of the uh, worst of by nuclear the way. It's, program. It's, it's just, as it's bad terrible. as like Freedom House's Freedom Index, which I think might um, be the worst uh, one. <laughs> you know, you get a B minus in Freedom. Derek, I'm going to start grading like, you on your Freedom this I, week. Yeah, you're not doing I, great. I don't think C-. I'm going to do so great. Yeah. <laughs> so what the breakout period is basically is the length of time that U.S. officials think it would take Iran to amass enough weapons grade uranium for one nuclear warhead. Uh, It's a lousy measure because it doesn't take into account all the other things that they have not done that they would need to do to produce a weapon. Uh, It doesn't take into account the fact that no country uh, sets out to produce a single nuclear weapon and then launch it because that's uh, suicidal. Um, it's, it's, It's a really lousy measure of anything meaningful. But Uh, The Obama administration, when they were negotiating the original 2015 agreement, made a big deal out of the fact that it limited Iran to a 12-month breakout period. So if the Iranians, under the terms of the agreement, if at any time they had said, you know, screw this, we're going to, you know, we're going to build a bomb, it would have taken them 12 months under the restrictions that the deal imposed uh, to get to the, the... uh, the place where they had enough enriched uranium for a warhead. Uh, why they would have abided by the, the restrictions of the deal to break out, if they were going to break out anyway, is, is unclear to me, but this was the metric uh, that everybody decided to use. Well, the story in the, the Wall Street Journal now says that uh, even if uh, the Biden administration successfully concludes talks to restore the 2015 agreement, which Donald Trump tore up in 2018, that Iran's breakout time will never get back to 12 months because of the advances that they've made in terms of uh, enriching uranium to higher levels, in terms of developing more advanced centrifuges that can work much faster than the the limited, uh, the very limited basic primitive models that they were uh, operating in 2015. So you're never going to get back to this 12 month standard. And of course, you have people from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and, uh, you know, across the Iran regime change community who are seizing on this story to say, aha, you should never do the, you know, uh, the Biden administration is making a mistake going back into this deal. Uh, they, they, you know, uh, they're admitting now to the the Wall Street Journal that the you're never going to have the same uh, level of restriction on Iran's nuclear deal. What, what's galling about this is that the reason Iran's breakout time, assuming you care about that, uh, has sunk below 12 months is because Trump did what these fucking numbnuts wanted and left the, uh, abandoned the deal, scrapped the deal. And so Iran did the same thing and they produced these advanced centrifuges. They made these technological advances and they began enriching uranium to much higher levels. So all of this stuff happened because they scrapped the agreement. If you actually care about limiting Iran's breakout time, then you would never have supported getting getting out from under the agreement. You would now be, you know, supporting reinstating that agreement or reviving that agreement because that's the the only tool that has successfully limited Iran uh, to date or limited its nuclear program to date. So it's fascinating to watch these guys who sowed you know, they're reaping what they sowed, basically, but they're using that as a justification for uh, the policies that they advocated in the first place that got us to this point. It's uh, it's sort of mind boggling to watch them work. But um, yeah, they're, that's, they're not that's where following are. facts and logic. It's very upsetting. to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, this is they the facts and logic crowd. There's, there's a lot of overlap <laughs> between them. Uh, but but when it comes to their own half assed ideas, I guess it doesn't uh, you don't have to follow uh, the same rules. <laughs> 
Well, uh, on that happy note, um, everyone, we've got a, a really interesting uh, interview coming up about um, Iran sanctions, uh, sanctions against Iran, and, and we hope you really appreciate that. And we've got a, a bonus episode with Jay Caspian Kang coming out on Saturday about his new book, The Loneliest uh, Americans. So thank you all for listening. We really appreciate it, and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. Hello, American Prestige listeners. It's Derek with you as uh, usual, I guess. Uh, and as usual, I'm joined by my uh, esteemed co-host, Danny Besner. We are very lucky this week to be speaking with Esfandiar Batman Gelij, uh, who is a visiting fellow with the Middle East and North Africa program at the European Council on Foreign Relations, founder and CEO of the Borson Bazaar Foundation, which is a, a think tank that works on economic uh, the intersection of economy and foreign policy, uh, economic diplomacy, economic development, uh, primarily focused on the Middle East and, and Central Asia. Uh, he is one of maybe, you know, five people in the world. If you want to talk uh, about U.S. sanctions on Iran and their impact, you would want to talk to to, to Yar here. So uh, we are very lucky to be joined by him. Uh, and, uh, well, we'll get into your piece in a second, Yar, but thanks for being on the program. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So you have uh, a couple of things people should check out. A new study uh, by uh, that's been published by uh, the Sanctions, Sanctions and Security Research Project called The Inflation Weapon, How American Sanctions Harm Iranian Households. Uh, you've written about the study for uh, over at Just Security in a piece called To Make Sanctions Policy More Humane, Limit Food and Medicine Inflation. Uh, and you also did a, an interview and a, a fed a, a very good piece, I think, by Spencer Ackerman, friend of the pod, uh, actual friend of the pod, not not joking. Yeah, about actual that. friend of the pod. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at his Forever Wars newsletter that's called Iran Sanctions and Inflation uh, as a Weapon of Mass Destruction. So people should check all those things out. We'll have links uh, in the show description. But why don't we start, uh, if we're going to start uh, talking about the effects uh, of U.S. sanctions on Iran, why don't we start with the history uh, of the U.S. sanctions program, which goes back um, you know, we think of it as going back to sort of the nuclear issue and kind of late Bush administration, early Obama administration, but it really uh, goes well, uh, starts well before that. Can you sort of walk us through that that history? Yeah, so the history of sanctions on Iran is largely a history of U.S. sanctions on Iran. And uh, that's something that, you know, we can talk about um, in more detail. But basically, you know, the U.S. is this power that has a unique ability to use sanctions to isolate countries from the global economy. And uh, they first started to use sanctions on Iran for that purpose way back uh, in 1979, when there was a, an initial set of sanctions imposed on Iran after the Islamic Revolution, when a government not very sympathetic to the United States uh, overthrew um, the, the Shah, uh, who was, uh, by some accounts, a sort of um, an American kind of puppet, or at least a ruler who was uh, very close to the U.S. And, and dependent and part of the U.S. security architecture uh, in the Middle East. And sanctions on Iran were tightened uh, in the 90s, um, but they really began to bite and have a meaningful impact on Iran's economic development uh, basically a decade ago, uh, right actually in 2012, when you had uh, financial sanctions imposed on Iran that for the first time, uh, essentially since the end of the Iran-Iraq war in the early 90s, saw Iran experience an economic recession. So a measure was taken by the U.S. and at that time also by um, uh, Western allies and at the U.N. level, and you had this um, clear impact on the Iranian economy. And since then, basically, Iran's economic development has been really sort of shaped by this external pressure of sanctions. And we've had what you can call a, a decade of stagnation. So before we go into that, why don't you just describe literally the basics of how sanctions function? What gives the United States the ability to strangle another country's economy through sanctions? How does the global economy literally function? So, 
how, sure. answering how take, the global take, economy take literally seconds. functions. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll try and I'll try and make it fast. I think maybe there's... talk about dollar diplomacy and access exactly. to the Fed, the two the two big ones. So there's there's really two things at play here, and there's two kinds of sanctions that um, that we can talk about. There's primary sanctions and secondary sanctions, and primary sanctions are uh, those sanctions that were first put in place by the U.S. all the way back in '79. And basically, primary sanctions are um, different kinds of uh, laws and measures that prevent U.S. persons or the use of the U.S. dollar uh, from being involved in, in different kinds of commercial activity in Iran. So that could be trade or investment. And you're basically saying, look, if you're a U.S. person, a U.S. company, or you plan to use the U.S. dollar, uh, these sets of activities are prohibited. And basically, the primary sanctions may mean that you're not able, as a U.S. person, to engage with Iran in an economic uh, way with the exception of a few areas, for example, humanitarian trade. But there's a second uh, category of sanctions that are secondary sanctions, which have proven much more complicated and, and actually much more harmful for Iran's economy. Because it's one thing if Iran has to account for the fact that it won't be dealing with the U.S., that's obviously a pretty consequential thing. You know, the U.S. is at least particularly from a financial standpoint, the kind of key global player. But it's not necessarily actually the big player in global trade, um, certainly not in the last two decades. And as a result, Iran might have accounted for that. But secondary sanctions are the U.S. response to the fact that, um, you know, countries can adapt to being isolated from engaging with U.S. players. And what secondary sanctions basically do is they say that for a certain set of activities or a certain set of activities with certain uh, entities in Iran, so government uh, institutions or uh, certain companies that might have links to the Iranian state or to the Revolutionary Guard, if as a foreign company, you transact with those entities or you engage in different kinds of trade in certain sectors with those kinds of companies that are subject to secondary sanctions, even if you don't use the U.S. dollar in those transactions or even if you don't involve U.S. persons, you open yourself up to being designated under a sanctions authority so that you actually also get prohibited from engaging with the U.S. financial system. And so what this means is that for a lot of companies, understandably, and particularly banks, if they have this choice between dealing with segments of the Iranian economy that could leave, leave them exposed to secondary sanctions uh, or not uh, engaging with those parts of the economy in order to make sure that they maintain access to the U.S. financial system, to the U.S. market, it's pretty much a no-brainer. And so secondary sanctions have been a really um, significant coercive tool that the U.S. is using not only in Iran, but in more, uh, more and more sanctions cases around the world. And it's creating all sorts of interesting tensions between you know, what does it mean for the U.S. to apply these sanctions in ways that often uh, prevent our allies from actually engaging in trade and investment that they consider to be perfectly acceptable and routine? Yeah, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how these types of sanctions developed and, and specifically in relation to Iran, which, as you describe, almost became... Uh, like a laboratory for, for U.S. policymakers to play around with uh, these sorts of sanctions, especially on the financial end. Um, and in addition, um, maybe you could give people a sense of how far-reaching these sanctions have become uh, in the case of Iran when you talk about you know, targeting segments of Iranian society and you can't do business with anybody who does business with the Revolutionary Guard, for example, or you can't do business with uh, these particular segments. Those are, those have the effect of kind of sounding on some level like they're, they're well targeted. But when you actually get on the ground, you, you sort of, uh, and look at, look at the effect that they have, you realize that uh, you're really targeting massive uh, kind of chunks of of the Iranian economy. So maybe uh, you know, talk about the role Iran played in the development of these things, and then uh, how far reaching they've actually gotten. So that's a it's an excellent question, um, and 
The reality is you can look at the kind of development of sanctions with a long view and with a short view. And for the long view, I'm going to defer to um, Nick Mulder, who's a, f- a phenomenal economic historian at Cornell. He has a book out that's getting really excellent reviews called The Economic Weapon. Uh, and he goes all the way back to the interwar period, basically 100 years ago, to talk about the development of sanctions as this kind of tool of, of coercive warfare. Um and, but realistically, if we want to talk about the Iran program, what I find really troubling about where we are now with our sanctions policy is that Iran really was the test case. And, you know, I was quite happy that uh, Spencer uh, Ackerman, you know, took the time to read the review and kind of put his, give his take on it. Because, in fact, a lot of the, the current use of sanctions that we're seeing, the kind, the genesis of that, the genealogy of that is coming out of the war on terror. And you basically had a situation um, in the late years of the Bush administration when, uh, you know, the national security kind of community and, uh, and those individuals that were, you know, American officials that were really committed to the U.S. having a robust foreign policy and interventionist foreign policy, I think they realized that the debacle of the Iraq war meant that in in coming years, a military solution or a military option was going to be uh, less on the table because the American public was just clearly quite tired of, um, you know, this notion that, you know, we have to engage militarily, put troops on the ground and get basically dragged into all these uh, quagmires. Uh, as we had in Afghanistan and in Iraq. And the response to that was an interesting one. And particularly, there were um, a, a group of officials at the Treasury Department that sort of came to realize that sanctions could be the solution for this problem. And if you read uh, Juan Zarate's Treasury's War, and Zarate was an official in the Bush administration at the time, one of the people kind of setting up the architecture of, of financialized sanctions. He writes about how essentially he and his, his colleagues started to look at the global battlefield of dollars and banks and that they started to conceive of the U.S.'s financial power as really a, a, another means to be quite um, interventionist, quite uh, uh, kind of aggressive and hawkish in the sort of international arena and that this was going to give the U.S. a leg up on different kinds of rivals, whether that was state rivals like Iran. You know, today we talk about Russia sanctions program, uh, increasingly the risk of using sanctions on a larger scale against China and also non-state actors. The idea that sanctions were this tool that could be uniquely used to deprive um, terrorist groups of funding that they need to, to conduct their activities. And so really the the kind of genesis of sanctions as this um, financial weapon uh, kind of starts in this period in 2006, uh, seven. And what was interesting is that when Obama came into office and uh, he sort of inherited this Iran crisis and Iran was starting to engage in uh, proliferation activity, the Iranian president at the time, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, was a, a difficult character, not interested in really having constructive relations with the West. The human rights landscape in Iran was growing more complicated because of the contested 2009 election and the subsequent sort of green movement. And the Obama administration felt the need to respond in some way to these crises. And they, you know, for pretty obvious reasons, looked at sanctions as the way to do it because it was a way to be quite sort of um, direct about having a response and to try and uh, put some pressure on the Iranian government to change its bad behavior. But it was a sufficiently different, at least on face, a sufficiently different means of putting pressure on an adversary that Obama and his administration could do it without being sort of tarnished with the same um, sort of political problems that would have beset him if he had taken, let's say, a more sort of a traditionally hawkish military approach to dealing with the Iran problem. Um, so the idea was use sanctions and then try and engage Iran in talks and uh, come to a negotiated solution, but kind of force Iran to the table using those sanctions. And, you know, what's been interesting is to see how uh, the 
even Democrats in the national security community in Washington have kind of looked back on the Iran sanctions case. And many people argue that the sanctions have been successful in that we did have a nuclear agreement in place until Trump tore it up. And it was an agreement that appeared to be coerced, uh, meaning that Iran was brought to the negotiating table because of the economic pressure that was being put on its on its economy. But um, I think that the reality is a lot more ambiguous than that. And, you know, the the claims around the efficacy of sanctions are uh, often made without a lot of evidence. We haven't had a lot of uh, good sort of studies or careful attention given to what actually happened in Iran's economy, how that influenced Iranian decision making. So we have this funny situation where the sanctions were developed, you know, a little over a decade ago as this alternative to, you know, the kinds of military adventurism that made the war on terror such a disaster. And yet we are in some ways, I think, repeating the same mistakes of, you know, adopting measures or or really deciding this tool is the only and best available tool and being quite interventionist uh, without taking adequate time to really consider, are we being effective in using this tool? And so in some ways, I actually see that uh, at least in the case of Iran, and I think other sanctions cases, we are once again finding ourselves in quagmires. They just happen to be at some superficial level less costly to the U.S., and so they're not having the same political cost for uh, American politicians that are advocating for sanctions as the first recourse when there is bad behavior from some adversary. So quick question related to that. You refer to, to bad behavior. So I'm curious, what do you think about the United States' entire relationship with Iran, a country that basically has a, absolutely no ability to threaten the United States in any way, shape, or form? Um, and particularly, how does do you think that relates to the United States' relationship with Israel? So we have this global behemoth, this hegemon uh, that is you know, traipsing around the world, thinks that every world region matters to it, but... Um, I have to say I disagree with that. So so what's your take on the geopolitical relationship itself? And do you see any chance of that improving over the next few decades? Or does the United States just essentially need some boogeyman that is going to threaten uh, indefinitely to uh, basically gin up support for this ridiculous military industrial complex we have at home? <laughs> so, I mean, I think that's the definition of a, a loaded question, but... Um, I think, uh, or a leading question, if not a loaded one. I mean, feel I, free look, to disagree. Honestly, no, no, I, 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 I I'd love to get into that. it. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think the point is like that is ultimately where I come down on this issue. I think this is a, you know, the, the um, perception of Iran as this enormous threat to U.S. national security is greatly overstated. It has been for, I think, specific political reasons. Um, it, you know, this idea that it is, it has been useful for the U.S. to have this kind of bogeyman. Um, you know, we went in and for a long time, uh, we sort of told ourselves we had dealt with the Taliban. We went in and we got rid of Saddam Hussein. And, <laughs> you know, there needed to be some other, you know, um, figure there for us to kind of, you uh, uh, use as a foil for what the U.S. was meant to do as a, you know, the one actor in the global system that was enforcing order and providing kind of peace and security as a dividend, uh, particularly in the Middle East. And Iran was that recalcitrant country that the U.S. was supposed to, um, you know, see as its rival. Now, What's interesting is that I think, unfortunately, we have squandered uh, what we what was a really historic opportunity to actually reset the relationship with Iran. And I do think that uh, the nuclear deal that was uh, implemented in 2016 was a remarkable diplomatic achievement, both because, of course, you had this commitment from the Obama administration to spend political capital on a negotiated solution for some security challenge in the Middle East, which is something that we had not done for a while. But also because uh, from the Iranian side, there was this um, remarkable commitment from this Iranian leadership and certainly from the government of Hassan Rouhani to engage in a multilateral uh, negotiations in which the US was really the key negotiating counterparty and try and find a pathway to a more sort of functional, possibly down the line, a normalized relationship. We had that opportunity and we squandered it, I think, in two ways. 
The easy answer for why that opportunity was squandered is because you would say you'd point to Donald Trump's, uh, you know, unexpected arrival as U.S. president and uh, the particular interests that were around him, his inability to think strategically, his impulsiveness, whatever it was, um, and the decision uh, to withdraw from the agreement. But one of the things that um, myself and some colleagues kind of looking at sanctions from our particular vantage point have been point have been trying to highlight in recent writings and, and make more of a topic of discussion among U.S. officials in particular uh, is this idea that the the initial problem was not there was an initial problem that was prior to Trump's arrival. And there was an initial weakness in the diplomatic negotiations uh, and the nuclear deal that was um, that came out of those negotiations. And that problem really stems from sanctions. And the, the issue here is that basically U.S. sanctions make diplomacy harder. Uh, because what we are doing is we are using a, a sort of coercive tool that the adversary doesn't have a really good response to. There's no there's no symmetrical answer for target countries in uh, a sanctions framework. Uh, unlike, let's say, in a military framework, where if we take certain military action, most adversaries that we're trying to deal with have some kind of military response that might be proportional to that. And so you can kind of manage the escalation ladder. With sanctions, it doesn't work that way. None of the countries we're sanctioning have really uh, an effective way of responding. Uh, that is similarly non-military and that is um, sort of similarly coercive in terms of uh, the timelines that it works on. So what do I mean by that? Well, when the U.S. Um, started to uh, basically sanction Iran, and we saw this dynamic get even worse under the Trump administration, Iran's response uh, to this kind of perceived economic war was to try and find leverage wherever it could for the negotiations. And uh, in some ways, uh, Iran uh, actually doubled down or at least consolidated its support for those aspects of its sort of um, military or proxy activities that uh, the, the um, or nuclear activities that the U.S. found most problematic. So when the Obama administration started to tighten the sanctions on Iran. Iran's response was, let's ramp up our nuclear program. When the Trump administration started to tighten sanctions on Iran, you got not only let's ramp up the nuclear program, but given the overall dynamics, you also got um, Iranian supported or Iranian directed attacks on uh, Saudi oil infrastructure, on tankers in the Persian Gulf, on even, um, of course, around the assassination of Qasem Soleimani on U.S. forces uh, in Iraq directly. And those escalations, the, the dynamic, the problem of this dynamic is that because Iran is responding in this asymmetrical way to what U.S. politicians and officials believe is a non-military and therefore somehow more sort of acceptable kind of coercion, then you have this reinforcing dynamic where Iran appears like more of a bad actor uh, in the U.S. discourse. And you get this idea that, you know, basically um, we can't lift sanctions on Iran because they are actually engaging in more problematic activities. So this is where you get this argument that uh, Iran is not only uh, the, the only problem we face with Iran is not just the nuclear program, it's also the ballistic missile program. It's also the support for proxies. It's also kind of um, the uh, involvement in other regional countries and the security threats that result from that. And so I think the issue that uh, comes up here is that sanctions basically make it harder for us to have a sober assessment of what the threats are in the region both because sanctions need to be justified on the basis of certain bad behaviors and also because the imposition of sanctions, a tool that the, the target doesn't have a symmetrical response to, leads to these kinds of asymmetrical responses that are usually exactly the same bad behaviors that the, that the U.S. Um, is using to justify the measures. So, um, you know, it's it's. In short, the consequence of this is that it's really hard to roll back sanctions programs because the intervening period in which the sanctions have been in place 
tend to create situations that for those people who are proponents of sanctions, make it easier to justify their continuation. And the behavior change that you need to see in the target country to justify a diplomatic agreement like the nuclear deal um, becomes harder and harder to bring about. And because we're not very good at lifting sanctions, and there are certain kind of technical issues around that we can also talk about, the target country is also dubious that if they do change behavior, they're going to get the benefits that are promised or that they're going to get sort of returned back to the trajectory that they would have been on prior to the sanctions being uh, imposed. And so it's a really complicated picture. And I think essentially, um, if we talk about something like uh, new quagmires that the U.S. is finding it themselves in, and again, going back to kind of Spencer Ackerman's piece, the you know, if we're going to give like a slow, a, a kind of headline for what's happening here, I mean, basically the economic wars that the U.S. is currently engaged in using the tool of sanctions are the new forever wars. There are similar dynamics at play, and arguably the dynamics are worse because it is even more difficult to get the political clarity of mind to understand what harms are happening and uh, why the U.S. needs to change course independently of some dramatic change of behavior in the target country uh, to try and get itself out of those um, sticky situations. So Yara, I, uh, I, I would, I feel like one of the, one of the issues uh, in with what you're, with respect to what you're talking about, uh, the difficulty of extricating uh, ourselves from these economic wars has to do with um, the fact that it is very hard to convey to people in the U.S. in a way that will cause kind of uh, a sustained response uh, just how impactful these sanctions are. It's not the same as, you know, people getting outraged over a drone strike or people getting outraged over a particular kind of uh, event that takes place. This is a sustained attack on civilians, basically, on ordinary people. Um, that said, if you do kind of explain uh, these sanctions to Americans in terms of people are going without food, people are going without medicine. I think you will get a response that, uh, you know, people will, will kind of recoil from that. And consequently, uh, I want to get into the, the meat of, of your study and what the impact really has been uh, on ordinary Iranians. But I'd like to start with, uh, the, uh, justifications or the the excuses, let's say, that are offered by U.S. policymakers when they're pressed on these subjects, when they're pressed on what is the impact of this going to be on food, on medicine, on basic uh, human needs, and their response is always, you know, some version of, well, we've created a carve out for this, we've created an exception for this, uh, but you know, talk a little bit about. Uh, that process, and and then we can get into what I think your study shows, which is these things are pointless. They're meaningless. They don't actually uh, preserve any access to these basic things for uh, for the people who are targeted. So I've been sort of dealing with this uh, issue of the humanitarian harms of sanctions for the better part of uh, 10 years now. It was kind of my introduction to the work of sanctions when I was a student and uh, it was, in fact, the first projects I did in Iran were related to a clinical trial of trying to get um, nicotine replacement therapy, so like uh, nicotine patches and nicotine gum into Iran. And the clinical trial was something that we could do, and we demonstrated, hey, this medication would really help uh, uh, make it easier for um, Iranian smokers to quit, particularly, interestingly enough, Iranian smokers who are also uh, addicted to opiates. Um, but at the end of the clinical trial, when it came to actually trying to uh, find a way to go to a global pharmaceutical company and say, look, we've demonstrated that uh, this uh, medication would help in Iran, um, and we have the medical research to back it up that was done locally with the Iranian university uh, using an OFAC license to back up this research. Um, meaning a license from the U.S. Treasury Department to permit uh, this activity, we weren't able to find a bank uh, to uh, engage in this new line of business because of this kind of chilling effect that uh, sanctions have, even in areas like the trade of food and medicine. And to be so, clear, this is, yeah. I mean, this is an effect, this is basically... Um, even if it's written into the letter of the sanctions law, if you approach yeah. the banks, uh, 
and say, you know, you're allowed to do this. They're, they're uh, the uncertainty about you know what is actually there and what they can get a, they can do or not do without triggering U.S. sanctions is such that they will uh, take themselves out of these these types of transactions uh, anyway, even if yeah. even if in the letter of the law they they can do it. Exactly. So I would say like you know ninety five to ninety nine percent of banks will just write it off. Will write off Iran, you know, uh, just because these sanctions are in place. A small, small percentage of banks will, uh, on a case by case basis, facilitate humanitarian trade, but uh, and they do that at great expense. They do that at great administrative burden, and basically because it's such a headache, um, they will only do it for large clients, for clients that have been around for a while, uh, and uh, they will often and they'll charge a premium in order to do that. And so this is one of the things I highlight in the paper is that even when this trade is taking place, and it's not that there's no food or medicine flowing to Iran. Uh, in fact, part of Iran's economic resilience is that it has continued to engage in international trade despite U.S. sanctions. But it is doing all of that at greater cost than those costs are passed on to ordinary people. So if I was to like try and explain you know, what is the consequence of our sanctions policy for ordinary Iranians? I think the way I would describe it is that it's really about the mundane tragedies. And what I mean by that is um, this is about people who for basically three decades, Iran was a country that had a volatile economic kind of planning and the government was not always getting it right in terms of how to get the country on the right track of growth. But for three decades, Iranians could be confident that their economic prospects would be better five years from now than they were today. And there was this steady tempo of economic growth, and there was this kind of optimism that was inherent in the development of the country. Then in 2012, you get the financial sanctions imposed, and for the first time, you have a sharp contraction, uh, a recession that was similar in size to um, uh, what the Great Recession was uh, for uh, the U.S., for example. So you had similar consequences. You had people who uh, lost their jobs. You had people that were suddenly dealing with um, significant uh, inflation. And so even if they had their jobs, their wages weren't allowing them to maintain the same standard of living. And it became a kind of race against time. People had to dip into their savings to just kind of keep things going. They were concerned about, you know, what the prospects would be next year and in the next few years. And generally, this kind of pessimism fed into the Iranian economy at large and, and into the thinking of ordinary people and ordinary households. And, you know, people might say, okay, well, if, if this is the consequence for most people, is it really that bad? I mean, it sounds like these sanctions are an okay kind of measure, but the issue is not so much what's happening to the middle class. I mean, we can, I think there are significant questions over why it is in the U.S. national security interest to immiserate the middle class of Iran or of any country. And we can ask big questions about whether that's tactically intelligent or strategically intelligent. And I think the evidence is that it's neither. But if we are going to look at humanitarian harms, part of the reason why in the case study I focus on inflation is that over the last decade, a lot of the debate over whether sanctions are harming ordinary people in Iran has focused on whether there are shortages of food and medicine. Is food and medicine less available than it used to be? But that framing actually misses um, the, the reality of the harm because in countries where the economy has proven relatively resilient to U.S. secondary sanctions and you don't have a runaway crisis the way you have in Syria or Lebanon or Venezuela, you're not going to see the kinds of um, shortages that we see in those countries where literally f food and medicine is scarce. Rather, instead of availability, what matters, and this is what I focus on in the case study, is the affordability of those goods. And the reason affordability is a useful way of thinking about this is that what we're essentially looking at are who are the vulnerable people in Iran's economy? Who was you know, who are the working class families that were maybe a little bit above the poverty line, you know, just getting by uh, 
And how has this significant situation of inflation rates of 40 to 50 percent a year meant that Actually, simply by being in the same position, even if the breadwinners in a household keep their same jobs, maintain their same wages, suddenly they are significantly worse off to the extent that maybe actually that household is no longer getting the same uh, level of caloric intake that it needs, or maybe it can no longer afford to fund uh, its, their children's education past you know, secondary school, and so on and so forth. And of course, for many families where there is something more significant, like uh, a loss of a full-time job, um, you suddenly find yourself sliding down below the poverty line. And that's, I think that loss of economic prosperity you know, we can think about it as at a macro level, as just numbers related to what the income distribution is in Iran and, you know, more people falling below a certain threshold. But at a micro level, if you look at individual households, I mean, basically what has happened is that because of these kind of vague concerns over the nuclear program and over Iran's status as a kind of regional hegemon, the U.S. has used a, an economic tool in sanctions that, um, despite being classified as a kind of targeted measure and despite being intended, at least ostensibly, to limit the revenues of the government and of certain kind of unfavorable entities like the Revolutionary Guard, the single most clear economic impact of the sanctions has been to create these high rates of inflation and then to basically lead to a significant loss of welfare through that inflation for millions of Iranian households. And when we, you know, sort of as, as Americans try and contemplate whether this strategy is sensible or whether these tools are the right tools for achieving whatever goals we have to set out, this is the economic consequence and this is the humanitarian harm that needs to be accounted for. And basically the contention of the case study is that we haven't been looking at this picture. Um, and just to wrap up, I mean, I think the other way of thinking about this is that sanctions proponents talk about economic impacts in sort of the abstract or at the high level. They'll say like, our sanctions are putting pressure on the regime because there has been this drop of oil exports, you know, this level of economic contraction, this level of inflation. But for whatever reason, given I think the general literacy on sanctions in the U.S. electorate and given how Washington is currently set up institutionally to think and deal with sanctions policy, there is no um, effort to actually define the economic consequences of sanctions as they pertain to the ordinary people in these countries. And that actually means that people can kind of shirk off the question of, are you doing, hum are you having humanitarian harms? Because all the politician has to say is, well, there are no shortages of food and medicine. Food and medicine remain available because of our exemptions. And that's how they can kind of get to the issue of whether or not they're having a harm. So, yeah, I, I, I mean, this may be a, a unfocused question, so feel free to, to, to address it however you, you would like. But what's the point? Why are we, why is the United States doing these sanctions? It's not uh, clearly, I, I, I feel like the Trump administration let the cat out of the bag in the sense that uh, it's not really about the nuclear program. Uh, if it were, uh, he wouldn't have backed out of the deal and, and reimposed sanctions. Um, there's no evidence that these things actually change behavior. So uh, is the goal to immiserate people enough that they will uh, rise up and and you know, change the regime uh, on the United States' behalf? Is the goal just to leave the sanctions? Are the sanctions the point? Uh, is it just a way for U.S. policymakers to do something that looks tough with very minimal cost? I mean, there's no uh, U.S. forces, obviously, at risk. There's no U.S. individuals at risk. Uh, the harms that, that are accrued by the Iranian people are, are not necessarily uh, known to the American public. So, uh, you know, is it that? What What's the point here, basically, is what I'm asking. Why are we doing this? And I, I wanted to ask this because one of the things that Spencer highlighted uh, from your study, and, and I think is very interesting, uh, is you spoke with Richard Nephew, who is sort of one of the architects of the, the sanctions uh, kind of wall. 
and he basically said there was a there was an intention to kind of uh, juxtapose luxury goods for the elite uh, with food and medicine for the the or for you know basic goods for ordinary people in a way to drive kind of enmity I guess or to to you know uh, make people resentful of the elite for for buying their luxury goods and and costing. Uh, you know, at a time when the, the the ordinary people were struggling to find, you know, food and 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 these other things. So, just to clarify, so I mean, I I have spoken to Richard on these issues before. The section that actually is quoted in the case study and in Spencer's piece is from Richard's book. So he's written a really interesting book called "The Art of Sanctions." Now. Uh, you know, I'll point out that it's just another way of, you know, saying the art of war, but this time it's <laughs> sanctions. And, uh, and, you know, in the book, he kind of goes through it. And it's a really, it's a, it's a, it is a unique contribution to our understanding of sanctions, because Richard was a key architect of the Iran sanctions program. And in this book, he's writing about kind of the considerations that went into how these sanctions were designed, who was being targeted, and what kind of the intended economic impacts are. And in some ways, I think to answer your initial question, you know, this book is one articulation of why are we doing this? In, and in the book, you know, Richard makes clear that uh, in his view, use of sanctions is about basically um, uh, giving the U.S. the tools to support some diplomacy that's taking place. And so the goal of sanctions policy is uh, to basically get Iran to the negotiating table and to make the concessions that they otherwise wouldn't make and to then get us an agreement that uh, can be enforced, um, you know, and basically take the problematic behavior off the table. In this case, Iran's nuclear program and the more uh, controversial parts of that program around significant uranium enrichment. Now, the problem is that lots of different sanctions architects, proponents, you know, um, even sanctions opponents will define the question of what is the goal of sanctions differently. On one hand, you have folks like, you know, uh, Mike Pompeo and Elliot Abrams, who basically were out there overtly saying that the purpose of sanctions was to put maximum pressure on Iran's regime. So from the bottom up, cause pain to people so that they would then sort of take to the streets and possibly even, you know, foment a revolution. And that is one version of sanctions and kind of the goals that that uh, policymakers might have in using them. Other policymakers are maybe a bit smarter in their political communications and will say that no, actually sanctions are meant to support diplomacy and it's about you know, causing pain so that there's a behavior change. And we define that behavior change in the context of some negotiated agreement where in in return for the target country kind of uh, accepting to res- accepting restrictions or, you know, abiding by certain norms or rules, we will lift sanctions. And so the Iran nuclear deal is a classic example of that. But I think there's another kind of goal that we can sort of conceptualize here. And I think this goal has become clear in the last uh, sort of couple months in the conversations around sort of the Ukraine uh, crisis. And the the goal is simply to do something. And I think that, um, you know, obviously, U.S. policymakers are under significant pressure in a global uh, arena that is chaotic, where the U.S. is really the sole kind of country that is taking upon itself the responsibility to, like, enforce an order, that there is some robust action in the face of, you know, whether it's human rights violations, uh, global kleptocracy, uh, a nuclear program that's gone awry, missile proliferation, whatever it is. And the easy thing to do is often sanctions. And so in some ways, the goal, I think, is just to do something. But the problem is that I feel that often U.S. policymakers that co-sign sanctions programs, often coming on board to programs that are being championed most vocally by people that have much bigger goals, like getting to maybe some sort of diplomatic uh, agreement or more often than not, actually trying to cause a revolution in the target country, um, 
that in co-signing with uh, the, those policies, they are not really considering what this easy solution is actually doing with regards to the possibilities for um, some kind of diplomatic uh, um, uh, solution for the given problem at hand. So to put this another way, I mean, my big concern right now is that there's very little differentiation between how progressives are approaching sanctions policy and how uh, people that we would consider kind of um, uh, orthodox hawks are uh, approaching sanctions policy. So at the point at which leading voices in the Democratic Party national security sort of um, community are advocating for similar types of measures that folks like Tom Cotton are advocating for, then I think we have reason to sort of step back and wonder, are we really, are we talking about the same goals first and foremost? And are we thinking about what this tool is actually able to do um, in a in a sober and um, and clear-eyed way? Because what ends up happening at the moment is some global crisis starts and the calls begin for sanctions to be imposed. And then we have the, you know, really uh, what many people have pointed out being this like bipartisan commitment to sanctions. And there is no, as a result, there's no one kind of acting as the check to say, okay, are we sure that this is the um, really effective thing to do? Are we sure that this is the humane thing to do? Are we sure that this isn't just the easy thing to do? I think, yeah, in a sense, it's, um, as you said, it's it's sort of mirrors the war on terror, the the kinetic aspects of the war on terror in the sense that uh, there is this drive to do something uh, that emerges before anybody's even considered what it is that we're trying to do. It's just, let's impose the sanctions and then come up with uh, a, a rationale or a way that, that you know, uh, the, the sort of victory conditions of victory where we would be willing to take the sanctions away we we do that afterwards or not at all even it's just sort of like let's impose these things and uh we sort of forget about it and and leave them there but i want um to talk about um you know i think you you raised a number of points in that response uh that get at kind of the the moral justification for these things to exist at all and i think uh, it, it seems obvious to me, it seems apparent to me that if the rationale is let's just do something, then, you know, depriving people of access to uh, or the ability to purchase food and, and medicine and other basic goods uh, is not justifiable. Uh, if the goal is to leverage some kind of a, a, an agreement to support diplomacy, as, you know, uh, nephew would describe it. Uh, you know, you can debate that, I guess, on a case-by-case -case basis, but I wonder now that we've experienced uh, an agreement, and, and as you alluded to earlier, the, the Iran nuclear deal was uh, reached for a, a whole complex of reasons. It's not just that the Iranians were under sanction and they were, you know, the sanction was so painful that they came to the table. We talked with Sina Tusi a few weeks ago about these, these talks. And part of the, the reason that they happened at all was the Obama administration gave in on the subject of uranium enrichment. So uh, it's a much more kind of nuanced, um, it, it was a much more nuanced process. But even if you sort of grant the, the contention that Iran, we punished Iran, Iran suffered, they came to the table, they negotiated this deal. Now we've gone through uh, a presidency, uh, you know, Donald Trump's presidency, where the United States just ripped the deal away. Iran did what we wanted it to do. They uh, abided by the agreement that we negotiated, and we took the, the deal away anyway and reimposed the sanctions. Moving forward with that as the uh, sort of precedent that's now been set, can you see a, a scenario under which any other country or, let's say, U.S. adversary is going to be willing to, uh, you know, is going to respond to to sanctions like this with diplomacy under the assumption that the U.S. is acting in good faith? Yeah, I mean, this is again that's sort of leading question, but no, but I mean, this is the big question, and um, you know, there's there's been this whole kind of debate in in Washington in recent days about like credibility and how important is this idea that the U.S. needs to be a credible actor in the global arena. 
And what's interesting is that um, in the context of the kind of Iran case, and, and specifically as we've been looking at the possibility that there might be sanctions relief again if the an Iran nuclear deal is restored uh, as as a result of the um, at this point uh, nine rounds of negotiations that have uh, been taking place uh, in Vienna to get the U.S. back into the deal. The one of the big things hanging over those talks has been this idea of credibility. So, uh, from the Iranian perspective, for exactly the reasons that you just described, there is this concern around: Is sanctions relief going to be verified? And are there going to be guarantees around that relief once it is implemented so that a future U.S. administration can't just unilaterally tear up the agreement? And, you know, in some ways, the good news is that um, uh, although we don't have, I think, very good answers to those two questions and the U.S. has not overnight establish the credibility of its sanctions relief commitments, it appears that Iran is going to bite the bullet and still enter the deal because it's uh, a restored deal, allow the U.S. to re-enter a restored deal uh, because it's in their economic interest to do so and because they want to kind of put a, a, a bookend to this crisis and, and move on with the challenges of governing uh, a country as complex as, as Iran. Um, but Still, there is going to be this uh, big thing hanging over the U.S. because what now is happening is because of the experience that other countries have had looking at the Iran case, there are question marks around what the meaning is when the U.S. imposes sanctions. So if you're Vladimir Putin <clears throat> and you see that there's a, a um, you know major increase in the sanctions, severity of the sanctions that are going to be imposed on your country... And maybe those sanctions are imposed, let's say, after you've, you know, taken some initial military uh, incursion into Ukraine as a way to create, uh, to punish you for that action, to create an ongoing cost to your presence in Ukraine. The question becomes, look, even if I withdraw from Ukraine and the U.S. Uh, and, you know, the EU in that case, um, you know, lift the sanctions, if I'm only going to get maybe 50, 60, 70 percent of the economic engagement that I had had prior to this imposition of the sanctions because of the lingering effects of those sanctions, even after they're lifted. And what we mean by lingering effects here is that, generally speaking, when the U.S. lifts sanctions, uh, it does it doesn't provide a lot of support for companies and banks that might want to re-engage the market that was formerly under sanctions. So there remains a lot of legal ambiguities, even when the sanctions are lifted. Usually some entities remain designated that, and meaning that you can't work with those companies. And if you inadvertently even work with those companies, you can become subject to major fines. And so all of these, you know, different, um, uh, kind of operational challenges mean that, you know, generally if a company has, because of sanctions, had to pull out of a country, it's not going to go rushing back in. Also, because it never knows if, you know, some other geopolitical incident uh, between the U.S. and that country is going to lead to the sanctions getting reimposed. So if you're a target country and the leader of that country, and you expect that actually you're only, you're not going to go back to where you were before the sanctions episode began, you're actually going to continue to incur a cost, then, you know, the decision to actually change your behavior looks a lot more fraught than it, than it otherwise, um, than it might seem to U.S. policymakers. And so I guess to kind of go back to the to basic point that you were making, which I very much agree with, you know, the problem here is that we're not having a sophisticated enough conversation about sanctions in Washington. Maybe it shouldn't be a surprise that our conversations about, you know, foreign policy are not particularly sophisticated. They don't seem to have been for a while. But I think the issue at stake here, and one of the reasons why um, I framed the case study the way I did to talk about sanctions as an inflation weapon, is that one way that we can at least try and put a little bit more onus on policymakers and politicians um, to justify their use of these tools is to say, hey, you're not using some like benign economic tool that, you know, is very easy to turn on and off and has limited consequences for uh, ordinary people. 
you are using a weapon and it is a weapon it is a you are waging a kind of warfare by another means and it is experienced by the target country the leadership of the target country and the people in the target country as a kind of warfare and therefore you know there should be a lot more sort of import to your deliberations about whether or not you want to support sanctions even if it seems like the only thing that is available the only solution and the final thing i'd say to that is that to the extent that sanctions appear to be the only tool the us has that is itself a deficiency of american foreign policy um and i i would go again to um i i like point everyone in the direction of nick mulder's book and and actually an excellent op-ed he had in the guardian recently where he pointed out um this idea that you know uh, there was in fact he in the archives he found a warning from John Maynard Keynes if i remember correctly uh back in this kind of interwar period when governments were starting to consider sanctions as really the the solution of how they were going to put pressure on their adversaries and he issued a warning and he said look you know we should be really careful and where we are considering sanctions we should be considering positive actions and i think it's the fact that the us has taken this idea that it can offer positive inducements to good behavior off the table completely any time a country is vaguely an adversary we are of the mindset that we can never offer anything that is a positive incentive for them to change behavior we can only seek to deprive them and that's how we're going to get their behavior change and i think that's a very dangerous uh, mentality that we find ourselves in no I'll stick no carrot exactly that that actually was probably a good place to end the interview, but I do want to ask you uh, to sort of round out our discussion of your study. Uh, and under the, I think, safe assumption uh, that despite all the flaws in these uh, in this uh, concept of sanctions, uh, their you know the questionable efficacy, um, the, the harm that they they do impose, and and the you know the problems that they create. Uh, I don't think they're going anywhere. Uh, they are, as as we've said in this interview, a very low cost way for U.S. policymakers to uh, display toughness, basically to play act uh, as though they're uh, taking things seriously. Uh, real low cost to to them, not low cost certainly to the people who are targeted. But uh, I don't think they're going anywhere. And and you talk a little bit about some of the ways that sanctions could be tweaked to avoid the worst impacts, uh, you know, in, in terms of inflationary pressure uh, and and kind of, you know, deprivation for ordinary people. So why don't we end with, you know, what your more realistic recommendations would be for uh, for the U.S. government as it, as it continues to wield this uh, club, how it could, you know, change things a little bit, at least to to minimize the worst parts of the uh, the program. Yeah, I mean, you know, sanctions are definitely not going anywhere. Um, and so I was careful in writing the report to make sure that, you know, there was this kind of effort to offer some practical solutions. Now, you know, I'll be very upfront and say I am not convinced by any of those solutions. And I desperately hope someone smarter comes along and uh, solves these problems and comes up with uh, kind of the mechanisms that can uh, mitigate the humanitarian harms that I've identified, specifically stemming from inflation, and also deal with some of these, let's say, strategic problems around sanctions and how they make diplomacy more difficult. Um, You know, what I will say is, by way of analogy, it's interesting to me that even if we are perennially frustrated with the inability of the U.S. military to minimize collateral harm uh, in terms of when it is engaging and deploying a military force in different places. At the very least, over the years, there has been this effort to um, understand the idea that collateral damage is unacceptable, that it needs to be minimized. There are There is an effort uh, kind of to uh, report on it. And you know, we are, again, per- perennially disappointed, but in theory, there is some level of accountability where, you know, if there are just egregious human rights violations or egregious kind of um, uh, civilian harms taking place, then you have this paradigm of like war crimes uh, 
that can be used to sort of say, okay, these things cross the threshold and, you know, uh, individuals were, you know, the U.S. government failed in its uh, sort of requirement to try and minimize uh, harm to ordinary people. And what's interesting is that although we have spent enormous energy developing sanctions as this kind of tool of economic warfare, <clears throat> there really hasn't been this um, parallel effort to figure out what is the threshold where the harms are just too great? How do we keep those people who are imposing sanctions accountable to make sure that they are minimizing the harms? How do we simply monitor that uh, harms are, whether or not they're taking place um, in the target countries? And I think that's a whole um, architecture that needs to be developed. It's a legal architecture, it's an institutional architecture, it's a political commitment. And that's something that we don't have at the moment. So, you know, the Treasury Department has many, many, many people and the State Department has many people working on targeting sanctions. There is, you know, basically no resource that's being um, devoted to assessing whether sanctions are uh, having the intended effects and whether the unintended effects include humanitarian harms. Um, there was, in fact, a, a really interesting government accountability office report from 2019 that looked at this and just basically concluded that none of the agencies responsible for sanctions policy, and there are a handful of them that are involved, have the mechanisms to actually figure out if what they're doing is effective. So at an institutional level, those resources are not there and they need to be. So in the case study, I suggest that if the resources were there, one thing we could do is if we decide that inflation, you know, really causing high, high rates of inflation is an unacceptable part of sanctions policy because it doesn't clearly help us achieve whatever our goals are as long as we're being kind of reasonable about defining those goals um, as being sort of consistent with U.S. national security interests, then you would create mechanisms to avoid the inflationary impacts of sanctions. So for example, one of the problems is that although in a country like Iran, food and medicine continues to be imported, it's a smaller number of suppliers using a smaller number of banks that are uh, engaged in that trade. And as a result, there's less competition on price. They have the ability to charge a premium. And so inherently the product that's arriving at the Iranian port and getting onto the uh, Iranian store shelves is more expensive than it should be. And we see similar effects in other countries like uh, Cuba in, in Venezuela, where we're basically exacerbating import dependence in these essential goods. And there are steps that can be done um, to address that. The final thing I would say is that there's also a test here for the Biden administration. And what was very interesting about the COVID-19 crisis was that it really clarified the role of global supply chains as being critical for the availability of food and medicine. And uh, Iran was one of the earliest countries to have a major outbreak of COVID-19. And at the time, because the Trump administration was engaged in maximum pressure, there was this impressive uh, kind of um, effort on the part of different stakeholders to point out the humanitarian harms that sanctions were having, progressive groups in Washington, people on the Hill. Uh, you had um, former Obama administration officials, including those that were involved in the sanctions architecture, writing publicly about things that could be done to ease the trade. And specifically, ease the functioning of supply chains so that food and medicine could remain not only available, but also affordable. Many of those people that wrote those op-eds um, are now in government, and they are in some of the offices that are responsible for devising this policy. And it remains to be seen whether or not they will basically act on what was their instinct when it was Trump and his administration that had his hands on the levers of sanctions. Their instinct was to question the efficacy of that strategy and to highlight the humanitarian harms and that the U.S. could be doing more. So far, to be perfectly frank, the Biden administration has not taken steps to alleviate the humanitarian harms of its sanctions programs in any substantive way in any of the major programs uh, in around the world. So I think a lot remains to be done. And, you know, unfortunately, there is this kind of uh, institutional inertia around a policy like sanctions. But uh, 
Um, I think the first thing that has to happen is we have to acknowledge that this is a weapon and that we need more sophisticated mechanisms and a more sophisticated political commitment to creating accountability around the use of sanctions. And then we might get to a point where some of the solutions can be developed. On that note, uh, Esfandiar Batman Galij, uh, thank you for being on the program. The study again, folks, is called The Inflation Weapon, How American Sanctions Harm Iranian Households. Uh, it's available at the Sanctions and Security Research Project. Uh, again, we'll have a, a bunch of links in the show description so you guys can check all that stuff out. Uh, Yar, thanks again for coming on the program. Thanks, there. It was uh, a pleasure. Yeah.